Good morning, High Street. Wow, let's give the band a round of applause. I can hear all of you clapping outdoors. It's so good to have you here. Um, if you're joining with us online or you're outdoors, welcome. We're so glad to see you here this morning. Um, and also, if you're, you're among those who don't normally join us here at High Street, if you're an online um, person who's just viewing what's going on here, welcome as well. We would love to have you, if you're local, um, come join a service with us now that we have outdoor services. Such an exciting thing. I don't know about you, but I feel it in our worship. I feel it in our scripture reading um, that God is doing something special here at High Street, just reopening and getting people together again. So good to be back. Um, we've been doing the Nourish series. My wife, my beautiful wife, mentioned that. Uh, it's about two cyclical biblical concepts we're doing per month that when brought together help us to nourish our own spiritual lives and the lives of those around us. So last week we did presence, which was really fun, and this week we get to dive into the theme of purpose. If you remember, we talked about God's presence, His Holy Spirit, not being just like a force, not being just a feeling, but being the person of God with us and within us who believe and follow Jesus. With the presence of God, we enjoy the sweetness of who he is, as well as at times we wrestle in the presence. And I, I use the term bantering in the presence, and we practiced that a little bit last week together, which was pretty fun. Um, the main point was, though, about the story of Moses and when he refuses to leave and lead Israel into the blessings, into the promises, into the purposes of God without the presence of God going with them. It was this relationship to the personal presence of God that Moses understood and that allowed him to walk in God's purposes. You know, and we all want to know what God's purpose is, right? But a million problems can get in the way of that. So today we'll see that God's presence is intimately connected to his purpose. And despite the continued confusion on our side, um, the, the Bible actually reveals a God who is always purposeful. We know the scripture, many of us by heart, that says the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. And it's a metaphor, the grass withers and the flower fades is a metaphor for us, for our lifetime, that our lives fade away, but God's purpose stands forever. You know, the confusion of purpose is, I'd say, 100% on our side, right? Though God doesn't always shout down to us, hello, Dave, or whoever this is I'm talking to, your purpose is this, right? We don't hear that booming voice often from the Lord. God does reveal his purpose to us. We have his word that we read and we study here on Sunday mornings. We have his spirit, like we've talked about, his presence, and we have his people to help us along the way. The point is that in all of this, even those three things I just shared, that purpose is always expressed in relationship. The majority of time, purpose is a process that's discovered through presence. And isn't this idea of purpose sorely needed right now? I mean, we're in the midst of shelter in place. It's been months since our church has met together. We're just doing that for the first time since March. I mean, it's so exciting, but we've faced being stuck in our homes. We've faced a pandemic. We've faced economic struggles. We've faced business struggles, relationship suffering. We've faced loneliness increasing, and we've faced the death of many people. And this has raised so many questions. Many of us have never felt more uncertain about our futures. And even though in a sermon this morning I cannot answer all those questions and how much I would like to, but as we recover and rebuild as a church, as we recover and rebuild as a society, as in America, as we recover and rebuild as a, as a world, we must realign with God's enduring purposes in order to build with and to stay with his presence. And this is especially needed in the church. And this is especially needed at High Street. So before we dive further in, let's take a moment and just turn our hearts and our minds together to the Lord. Would you pray with me? 
Lord Jesus, we're honored that you've already been here this morning, that in your plan that you purposed a Sunday morning where we could regather, where we could reopen, where we could see people's faces again, you know, albeit they're masked a little bit, but so glad to be in each other's presence again. Lord, thank you that you brought this about, and we are turning to you this morning to invite your Holy Spirit to be here the spirit that you promised, your presence, your person with us to guide us, to speak to us, to counsel us in those areas where we need it most. We are wondering, what is your purpose in the middle of this? How do we deal with the gray areas? How do we walk forward and rebuild? What is going to happen to our lives, our relationships, our world? Lord, more than ever, we need your purpose to be clear to us. Would you help us to understand? Would you guide my words? Would you speak really through your word and your Holy Spirit to us this morning? We're hungry. We're ready to hear, and we want to align with your ways to be able to know you better. Would you help us to do this in the name of Jesus? Amen. Well, when I was talking about this story with my wife, she pointed me to, reminded me of a story about a lady named Susanna. Um, Susanna Oh, and I actually have the story on my phone. My wife will bring it to me. Susanna lived in the 1700s and was a mother. She was a very ordinary lady on the outside. You wouldn't have known unless you peeked behind her door who she was. Thanks, Care. Um, And what what was going on. So let me read a little bit about this, and you can hear how, how her life looked. Behind the door of Susanna's home, there was more to her story. Susanna had married a man who couldn't manage money well. They disagreed on many things from money to politics. Together they had 19 children, but all except 10 died in infancy. So that's nine children that passed in infancy. Samuel, her husband, left her to raise the children alone for a long time as he did his exegesis on the book of Job, which is about suffering. Kind of funny. One of Uh, Susanna's children was disabled. Another couldn't talk until nearly six years old. Susanna herself was desperately sick most of her life. They, as a family, struggled with poverty. Debt plagued them. Samuel, her husband, was thrown into debtor's prison once because their debt was so high. Twice, the homes they lived in were burned to the ground. But early in Susanna's life, She vowed that she would never spend more time in leisure, entertainment, the busyness of life than she did in prayer and Bible study. It's pretty brave. Even amid the most complex and busy years of her life as a mother, she still scheduled two hours each day for fellowship with God and time in His Word, and she adhered to that schedule faithfully. The challenge was finding a place of privacy in a house house filled to overflowing with children. Her solution to this was to bring her Bible to her favorite chair and throw her long apron over her head, forming a sort of tent. This became something akin to the tent of meeting, the tabernacle in the days of Moses in the Old Testament. Every person, every child in the household, from the smallest toddler to the oldest domestic helpers, knew well to respect that signal. When Susanna was under her apron, she was with God and was not to be disturbed except in the case of the direst emergency. There, in the privacy of her little tent, she interceded for her husband and children and plumbed the deep mysteries of God in the Scriptures. This holy discipline equipped her with a thorough and profound knowledge of the Bible. Um, She continues in her story and and in her devotion to Christ, while while her husband Samuel was away, as was often the case, she substituted as a minister and brought Sunday morning sermon to her, her children at home. She um, found the Sunday morning messages to her, for herself that her husband would preach and others uninspiring and lacking in spiritual meat, which I thought was interesting. She had a good-sized congregation of her own, the 10 children, so she began teaching them the Bible in her kitchen on Sunday afternoons. Soon neighbors began asking if they could attend, Word circulated, and others from the area began asking permission to attend as well. So thorough was Susanna's knowledge of the Bible, and so gifted she was at communicating its truth that on any given Sunday after church, Susanna would have as many as 200 people in attendance at her family home, which 
um, started in her home and then moved to a larger venue. Susanna passed away in 1742, let's be clear, at the age of 73, living long enough to see her sons, you might recognize these names, John and Charles, become world-renowned leaders of the global Christian movement. This is John and Charles Wesley, who participated in the Great Awakening. This is Susanna's legacy, forged in a large part in those diligent hours of intercession under that makeshift apron tent. John Wesley, her son, preached to nearly a million people in his day. At the age of 70, he delivered the gospel message of salvation to 3,200 people without the use of a microphone. He brought revival everywhere he traveled. His brother Charles wrote over 9,000 hymns, many of which we sing today. That's the story of Susanna Wesley. She lived in ordinary circumstances, had some extraordinary difficulties, but as she tied together presence and purpose, her relationship with God became the soil for God's purposes to flourish, not just in her lifetime, but for generations to come. Now, if you study the etymology of purpose, you'll find that it's actually two old words brought together, one that meant to cease and the other that meant to go forth. So it when you brought, bring those together, it actually means something like to cease all efforts or paths or opportunities to engage in this one thing. Isn't that surprising? I don't know about you, but our version of purpose is something like, if I can do 10 to a million things at once, then I feel like I have a purpose. But the old original version of purpose is learning to do one thing well focused on this one thing. Jesus says it this way in the Amplified Version. I really like this. It'll be a familiar verse for you. He says, but seek, aim at, strive after, first of all, his kingdom and his righteousness, his way of doing and being right, and then all these things that we worry about will be given to you also. So we try to do a million things, run down a hundred different paths, But Jesus says, you do one thing. This is your purpose. Cease all other efforts to engage in one thing. So purpose is not about doing more for God. But it's more about shifting the motive for which we do all things. So I don't know about you, growing up when I would hear something about Susanna or even scriptures about purpose, I would think something more along the lines of like, well, I guess I need to be a missionary to an impoverished country. Or I need to go serve the poor locally. I need to be, maybe become a pastor, which I'm doing right now, but that wasn't what I was thinking of then. I probably wanted to be in a band. So we think it implies doing more for God or having a specific, you know, culturally looking divine role rather than shifting our hearts to the purposes of God in our situations now. So it's instead having our goal be to discover the purposes of God in his sovereign will and the way that he's made the world, as well as to discover his purposes for you, purposes for me, his personal will. So there's a sovereign will and his personal will. And in purpose, as we discover that in his presence, both will be surfaced. I mean, what do you know of God's purposes for his world? What about for yourself? What do you know of God's purposes for you? Well, in that passage that we talked about earlier, when Moses refuses to move without the presence of God, refuses to go into the blessings, into the purpose of God without God's presence, in that same conversation, two verses earlier, Moses says this. This is Exodus 33, verse 13. Moses says to God, now, he's praying this, now if I have found favor in your sight, show me your ways that I might know you in order to find favor in your sight. Now, I don't know about you, this sounds like a little bit repetitive to our Western ears. Like, didn't you already say favor once? Didn't you already say, you know, know you and what's going on here? Well, in Hebrew thought, uh, they instead of thinking linearly like we do, we would put the most important point at the end. If you're taught to write a good essay, your conclusion, 
make it go out with a bang, right? Drive it home. That's where we put the meaning. But in Hebrew thought, they put the meaning right in the middle. It's kind of like a hamburger. You have a bun, lettuce, tomato, meat, other good goodies, bun, right? And the meat's right in the middle. The most important point is there. And so if we read this with that thought, the actual word that is the middle is this word ways. This in Hebrew is called a chiasm. And um, if you'll find this all over. Sometimes it's in a paragraph form, sometimes it's in a sentence, sometimes it's layered through a whole chapter, or a whole chapter, even a whole book of the Bible. It's really amazing once you begin to think like Israel did. But let's, let's digest this a little more. Um, Moses says this, and right at the center is that word ways. So we're going to look at that sentence. It says, show me your ways that I might know you. And it's actually the same, show me and know you are the same word in Hebrew. It's yada. And then ways is this word derech. And you got to get that phlegm in there. Yada, derech, yada. So he, Moses is putting that meat right in the middle of the sentence. So yada means this. It's got a wide application. It's the idea of to know. But in this context, it means to perceive, to discern, to consider, to know by experience and be acquainted with. And because of that, to be wise in, to be skillful in. Yada is actually used of Adam and Eve when Adam knows Eve and they conceive a son. So Yada is intimate, personal experience. It's like Moses saying, God, I want to learn to know you, to perceive, to discern, to consider, and by personal experience to be wise and skilled in. To be wise and skilled in what? Well, that next central meat word, the burger, is derach. That word means ways. Um, some notes that uh, help to clarify it. Ways is like the road, the path, the direction. It also has this idea of like manner or habit, like the thought patterns. And when it's used of God, it actually implies like his created order. Kind of like we talk about people going against the grain, right? And that being like a hard thing to do, you get resistance. Well, this is God's grain. If you go with the grain of God, it actually is smooth and beautiful, and you begin to understand the way the world works. This is his sovereign will and his personal will in his ways, and the personal will for Moses and also for us. So the point is that this way of God, his purposes is sort of like a path or a road. It's the order of his creation, his moral character, that as we follow him, we begin to tap into and understand his heart, his thoughts, his habits, and his history. So these truths about who God is is contained in that word. And they begin to be known, they begin to be yada as we are in his presence. So this idea of yada, derech yada, is, let me summarize it. This is sort of what Moses is praying his heart. Lord, let me have personal, intimate understanding and experience of your ways. Let me discern your created order that extends like a path behind and before me, where as I move forward, I can grow deeper in relationship with you experiencing your manner and your habit, learning who you are that keeps me in line with your purposes and helps me to discover your specific purposes for my life through continued communion with you. See, God's purposes are intimately connected to his presence. And ours, as we bring our presence to him, we can discover what those purposes are. See, God actually, in the Bible, holds Israel accountable to this, this prayer that Moses prays. God means for his purposes in presence to transform us. Hebrews 3, 7 through 11, says it beautifully. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, 
Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. So we see God implying something about Israel's accountability to his purposes and that purpose being discovered in their relationship with him. The Amplified Classic Version of the Bible translates one of those verses really clearly to tease us out. It says this, Israel, they have not perceived or recognized my ways and become progressively better and more experimentally and intimately acquainted with them. Therefore, they shall not enter my rest. Wow, experimentally and intimately acquainted with God's ways. God's holding us accountable to this sort of experience with him. See, this implies that not only can we know God's purposes, but God expects such a close relationship with his people that they would be transformed by them. And he even connects our transformation and relationship to his purposes with our experience of rest. Okay, but how do we do this? Well, Hebrews continues in giving us a picture of what it means to be experimentally acquainted, to be intimately acquainted with God's purposes. Hebrews 5.14 says, Solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good and evil. For those who have those powers of discernment trained, this is experimentally acquainted, and by constant practice to distinguish good and evil. That means if you're practicing, you know, practice makes perfect, perfect practice makes perfect, but if you ever practice anything, you know you don't get it perfect the first time, or the second, or the third. So part of God's purpose of his ways is to train us, to train us to walk more closely with him, to discover as we go deeper layers to his purpose in our life. You may understand the sovereign will of God, but do you understand how that affects who you are, the choices you're making, your own task list, the way you do laundry, the way you do your work, the way you interact in your marriage. You see, God says something like, you know, you, you thought I was teaching you patience, but I was also showing you my patience with you. Right? It goes deeper as you spend that time with him. You yada, you know by experience. And as we join God's purposes like that, we can actually be trusted with his purposes in our own lives. So we become more like him and then his purposes can overflow to other people. If we don't know God like that, how can we express his purposes in this world and how will his will be done? We know that God doesn't need us, but he wants to move through us. He wants to train us. He loves developing us into this maturity where by constant practice, our discernment is trained to discern his purposes, good and evil. There's a beautiful scene in the story of Narnia, Prince Caspian. If you're familiar with it, there's four children who get swept away into a magical realm called Narnia that mirrors the story of our relationship with God. Lucy, the youngest, is most familiar with the Jesus figure named Aslan. And in this story, Lucy glimpses Aslan telling her and the four children to go one way, but the children doubt her. The group won't listen, and finally, even though she sees Aslan and no one else does, Lucy gives in. They are anxious to move forward. They're ready to get to this battle to help save Narnia, and so they go this other way that seems easier. They face a treacherous path, 
they are exhausted. They, once they get to the bottom of this ravine where they barely uh, scramble through all these rough bushes and get cut up, they are attacked by soldiers. Arrows are shot at them, and they're forced to go back all the way the same way. They end up wasting valuable time. And once they sent camp, set camp that night, Aslan has a dialogue with Lucy. I want you to hear what this dialogue is like and think about presence and purpose in the story. So warm breath came all around Lucy. She gazed up into the large, wise face of Aslan. Welcome, child, he said. Aslan, said Lucy, you're bigger. That's because you are older, little one, answered he. Not because you are? I am not, but every year you grow, you will find me bigger. It's the idea of maturity, right? For time, she was so happy that she did not want to speak, but Aslan spoke. Lucy, he said, we must not lie here for long. You have work in hand, and much time has been lost today. Yes, wasn't it a shame, said Lucy. I saw you all right. They wouldn't believe me. They're all so... From somewhere deep inside Aslan's body, there came the faintest suggestion of a growl. I'm sorry, said Lucy, who understood some of his moods. I didn't mean to start slanging the others, but it wasn't my fault anyway, was it? Lucy looked straight into, or the lion looked straight into her eyes. Oh, Aslan, said Lucy, you don't mean it was my fault. How, how could I have left the others? And come up to you alone. How could I? Don't look at me like that. Oh, well, I suppose I could. Yes, and it wouldn't have been alone, I know, not if I was with you. But what would have been the good? Aslan said nothing. You mean, said Lucy rather faintly, that it would have turned out all right somehow? But how? Please, Aslan, am I not to know? To know what would happen, child, said Aslan, no. Nobody has ever told that. Oh, dear, said Lucy. But anyone can find out what will happen, said Aslan. If you go back to the others now and wake them up and tell them you have seen me again and that you must all get up at once and follow me, what will happen? There is only one way of finding out. Do you mean that is what you want me to do, gasped Lucy. Yes, little one, said Aslan. Will, will the others see you too, asked Lucy. Uh, certainly not at first, said Aslan. Later on, it depends. But they won't believe me, said Lucy. It doesn't matter, said Aslan. Oh dear, oh dear, said Lucy. And I was so pleased at finding you again. And I thought you'd let me stay. And I thought... You'd come roaring in and frighten all the enemies away like last time. And now everything's going to be horrid. It is hard for you, little one, said Aslan. But things never happen the same way twice. It has been hard for all of us in Narnia before now. Lucy buried her head in his mane to hide from his face. But there must have been magic in his mane. She could feel lion strength going into her. Quite suddenly, she sat up. I am sorry, Aslan, she said. I am ready now. Now you are a lioness, said Aslan, and now all Narnia will be renewed. But come, we have no time to lose. You see, Aslan is developing purpose in Lucy. She was ready to be saved out of her situation, but Aslan is doing something in the midst of it. And even when Lucy fails to understand and fails to follow, even with the delay and the struggle in Aslan's presence, Lucy remembers who he is and his purposes to be worked out through her life. So, wonder with me, why isn't it easier to walk in God's purposes? You know, Proverbs 4.12 made a consensus. You know, ancient Israel said it this way. There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it is the way of death. 
It's a bit discouraging. I think we can rely on our intuitions. There is a way that seems right to man, but in the end, it is a way of death. You know, so often we can think our purpose is leading us one way, but we end up not where we planned. We face tough hurdles, and sometimes we abandon our purpose altogether. We face discouragement, frustration, and then a lingering suspicion of purpose altogether. I mean, did you know that humanity's purpose was deceived from them at the beginning? Did you know they were tricked into abandoning their call, their purpose that God called them to at the very beginning of time? This has been a struggle since Genesis chapter 3. You know, God called Adam and Eve to reign, to rule, to have dominion over his creation, to develop it. He only had one command from them, and it was, do not eat from this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And in that relationship, they would express presence and purpose together. Even on the day that Adam and Eve were created, it was day six of creation. And their first day of work was the seventh day, the day of rest. So even their work, their purpose was meant to begin at rest with the Lord. But two distortions came in when this snake deceived Adam and Eve. Eve, by being tricked by the snake, reached for the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. This wasn't direct rebellion, but she thought that this was going to bring her wisdom. But it was a wisdom, it was a drive apart from relationship with God. But Adam, too, was accountable. Adam neglected the command of God and received Eve's decision to take the fruit without thinking about that command for himself. Adam accepts Eve's acceptance of the lie. And surprisingly, both are accountable for that. I don't know about you, but I think it's a lot easier to ignore the problem than try and engage with it, even if we engage wrongly. Majority of us step away or remain seemingly neutral. There was a time in the 1930s when Germany did a very similar thing as a people group. Did you know that when the Nazis rose, when Hitler came to power, that Germany was a mostly Christian nation? So we need to consider whether we may walk in selfish ambition like Eve did when she chose wisdom apart from God, or whether we walk in self-omission and step away from the promises, the blessing, and the purposes of God that might seem hard for us to understand and wrestle with. The point is that both ambition and omission lead to slavery to the deceiver. We actually live in a lie, so our purpose is the wrong-hearted purpose. We're not aligned with God. And rather than receive the freedom and rest of living into God's purposes, we end up walking on a path that leads to frustration and confusion. The point is, we were meant to walk in restful relationship with the Lord, working out these purposes, but sin, brokenness, has gotten in the way. And we dove into this in our series, the first sermon on restore. So if you're curious on how that works, jump into that. But we need to know that when we engage with purpose now, we experience something common, no matter whether it's an omission or whether it's ambition, we experience weariness regarding purpose when we practice purpose apart from God's presence. When Messiah comes on the scene, Jesus, he gives this great invitation. It might be familiar to you. He speaks to the weary. He speaks to the burdened. He speaks to those who are ambitious. He speaks to those who are omitting. He says this, Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. Some of you can say it from memory. Come. 
Come to me, says Jesus, all who labor, purpose, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. See, many of us are carrying the burden of purpose alone. And it's heavy, and we're tired, especially when we look at the world nowadays. While others of us have given up carrying the burden of purpose at all and lose out on learning God's ways and his heart. But Jesus teaches us purpose that is connected to presence brings restful action. There's a beautiful picture of oxen I'd like to put up on the screen Jesus speaks of a yoke being yoked to him. And he's implying this metaphor of a young ox tied to a mature ox. This was how farmers would train up the next oxen in the generation. The strong ox, the one that has practiced and knows the ways of pulling the whatever yoke, and the ox actually shoulders the heavy burden of the yoke, while the younger ox learns to walk alongside the old ox, to be trained by the ways of the old ox. I think this is beautiful. I mean, can you begin to imagine what purpose might look like when it's connected to presence in that image? What if we let Jesus shoulder the burden with us. Would his strong shoulders make that burden light? Make that burden a bit easier? And what if we yoked ourselves to him? How might he train us according to his ways and his purpose? What might we discover in the process? You know, when we shift our burdens, our current purpose onto the shoulders of Jesus... A few of us will end up throwing away unneeded yokes, right? Like it's just, that's not right. We don't want to be walking with the Lord. And the Lord will reveal that to us. But most of us just need to be paired with the strong ox who is Jesus. Most of us need to take the burden that we're carrying that's not necessarily wrong. But sometimes it's wrong-hearted. It's not a wrong burden but maybe we're not carrying it for the right reason anymore. We need a strong ox. We need the perfect strength of Jesus found in relationship to him to carry the burden and to train us in his ways. You see, like we said earlier, purpose is found in the process of the presence of God one step at a time. This is a day-to-day retraining. A lot of us would like to have the end of the story. We think like Western Christians, give me the final chapter, which luckily in here we have that, although many people argue about it. We need Jesus here and now, especially in this season, to yoke with us, to shoulder with us the burden. We walk paced with Jesus. We learn his way while in his presence. There's this beautiful picture um, in a book that a mentor friend of mine wrote called The Story of With. I'd like to share it briefly with you. The Story of With is about a girl named Mia. It's an allegory, and each of her adventures along the way, she's learning something about who God is. Each portion is broken up into these four vials, and each vial has a lesson that she learns. So as I read, she will have these vials, and she's... in 
suddenly swept into this moment where she runs into her father who, she, who disappeared 23 years ago and she doesn't understand why. And now, in this allegory, she suddenly gets a magical moment to relive this with her dad. Let's look at what happens. Mia's jacket was transformed into a sweater while she was wearing it. Her hands raced to the front pockets. She let out a sigh of relief. The remaining vial was in her right front jeans pocket. She'd worried about the other, other vials later. At least she'd had the one that needed to be filled. Hey, girl. She turned to see her father approaching. Her eyes grew wide. Dad? This couldn't be. He, he left so long ago, yet... Here he was, back home, wearing his favorite pair of jeans, flannel shirt, and cowboy hat. She ran to him and wrapped her arms around him in a tight embrace. You're here. Sweetheart, are you okay? She gently, he gently pulled back to look at her. Dad, it's, it's really you. I can't believe it. I can't believe we're here together. You're the reason I took this journey. Journey? Where were you? Mia wiped tears from her eyes. I've just been tending the crops. What, what are you doing here in the fields? No, no, listen to me. You left when I was six, but then I found your truck in the forest and set out to find you, and the forest, my, my truck is right there. We had breakfast together this morning. Don't you remember? Whatever here was, Mia realized it wasn't her actual past. It was a version of reality where her dad had never left. She goes on to share with her dad that this was her 16th year, 16th birthday, I believe, and her date for the prom had just backed out on her. In, this, in the reality story, her dad wasn't there, but now she gets to talk with him. She says this is the worst day of her life. It was the worst day of her life. Mia loved being with her father, but this was surreal. This had been the worst day of her teenage years, but from the moment he appeared, the story was changing. It was as if her past was being rewritten in new ways. They jump in the car. Looking out the passenger window, she saw the diner's neon sign against the moonlit sky. They pulled into the gravel parking lot and found a parking space near the front door. Mia's dad turned the ignition off but didn't move to get out of the truck. I picked up a little something for you. He leaned over and popped open the glove box. He reached in and handed to her what looked like a small book wrapped in brown paper. Can I open it now? He smiled and nodded. She slowly unwrapped the paper to reveal a leather journal. She started to cry. What, what's wrong, sweetheart? Nothing. This is perfect. Mia's been on a journey to discover purpose. Her father chuckles. Well, then what are the tears for? Because this is all I want, but it isn't going to last. Sure it will. I wish it could. She flipped through the pages of the journal. She turned to the first page. The inscription on the inside cover read, With you always, love Dad. She brushed a tear from her eye. We get to fill this out together, said Dad. You and me, road trips in this old truck, watching your favorite movies, finding the perfect burger joint. Every blank page means another adventure. That sounds wonderful, Dad. I love being with you no matter what we do. I have since I was a girl. You're still my little girl, he squeezed her hand. They go into the diner. Mia's looking around for her dad. And a waitress pointed to the jukebox across the diner where her father was bent over the neon machine. He turned and smiled as her favorite song began to play. Holding her gaze, he approached the booth. Seeing that this is homecoming and all, I was hoping maybe I could have this dance. Someone had invited her to dance her father. She stepped out and they stood facing each other. The folks in the diner looked up momentarily and then went back to their conversations. He put one hand on the small of her back and held her other hand firmly near his shoulder. Together, they shuffled their feet to the song. He whispered in her ear that she would always be his girl, how proud he was of her and how beautiful she was. She wished that moment could last forever. They slide back into the vinyl booth, booth across from each other. She notices something. She says, you seem restless, Dad. Do I? I? I guess I'm just hungry. Then let's order. He laughed. I'm talking about another kind of hunger, sweetheart. 
about dreams that keep me up at night. I want more for me and for us. There is more, Dad. She pulled the vial out of her pocket. Do you know what this is? He took the cork off and looked inside. An empty container? Yes, but it doesn't stay empty. Think, Dad. Please try to remember. He held the vial in front of his mouth like a microphone and tapped on it. Is this thing on? He winked at her. Ladies and gentlemen, never before has this diner seen such a beautiful woman on the dance floor. She grinned. Her dad held the makeshift microphone but now spoke with soft tenderness. I love being your dad. I love spending time with you. Just us. Together. He reached for the cork on the table. Wait, don't put that. He sealed the vial and handed it to her. Her dad grinned. Now your vial isn't empty. It's filled with my words. She felt a rush of cold air around them. Something was shifting. No, no, no. It's okay, sweetheart. I was just trying to make you smile. The dinner, diner rippled before her. She grabbed his hand. I can't lose you again. Mia, what's happening? Where are you? But it was too late. The vial was satisfied. Wind rustled as the diner blurred and faded. The last thing she saw was her father's strong hand in hers. Such a beautiful picture of our interactions with our Heavenly Father. There's something missing. We've been deceived. Our purposes end up broken when we do them apart from the Lord. But when we're able to have that sweet interaction in His presence, like Lucy and like Mia, we can remember again the purposes of God. We can be realigned and rebuild together what His sovereign will is in our world as well as His personal will for us. We're going to take a little bit and celebrate together through taking communion. This is an amazing Sunday because we have people here at church more than just five of us. So take a moment, grab your elements, and let me share a little bit more about communion and purpose. When we consider communion, we remember that Jesus took on our sins and our sufferings and bore them to the cross. In that, he carried all of our purpose, all of our failure, failures, all of our struggles, all of our fears, everything we've omitted to do and everything we've done without him. Jesus carried the weight of that on his shoulders. He walked perfectly in God's purpose. And that's why when we talk about derech, the way, Jesus calls himself the way. He is the way. And if you want the ways of God, if you want the purposes of God, look no further. Look at Jesus. He can realign you with presence and with purpose. So as I read the scripture, once you have your communion cup, I want you to hold your hands out. And we're going to consider together this Jesus. We're going to take a moment with him in his presence to realign some of our purposes. Jesus, because of what you did, you bring your presence to us and we can be realigned with who the Father is. And just like Moses said, we want to know his ways. We want to walk in his purposes so that we understand him and also so we understand his ways in our life. And so that we don't walk in weariness anymore, but we can walk in restfulness. Lord Jesus, would you teach us to be yoked to you today? Would you forgive us for the ways that we have turned away from that yoke where we tried to carry the burdens of purpose on our own and where we've been deceived or tricked away from your guidance. Lord Jesus, how we like to have your strong shoulders carrying this burden that we have, the things that are in front of us now. And we want to be trained. We don't just want you to carry it with us. We want you to show us more of who you are so that like the author of Hebrews says we can be discerning, we can be practiced, we can be experimentally intimate with you.